first of all, New York, thank you for having me. I'm honored. You know, if I travel and I'm traveling now and operating in the South and in the North and then trying to encourage minorities and women to enter this industry, I will tell you, I, it's so nice to be in the North because when I go down in the South, they're like, do you have weed on you? And I'm like, what's weed? You mean medicine. Let's get it straight. So thank you for the shout out for Dr. Healer. I, I heard that over here somewhere. So, and I, I love that. So let me just describe about what this looks like to be a black woman in this industry, to go through all these hurdles and still don't have a voice that is heard in this industry. And I definitely have to focus on what is important for me, but also what's important for the patients. So I started this industry back in, in this industry back in 2013. And the first thing my family said to me is that you just want to go to prison. <laughs> and I said, well, my kids and all the drama they give me might not be too bad of a choice. So I was like, but let me just see what this looks like. Um, so just to give you a little bit background, I am a cell biologist. I'm a two-time Howard University graduate, HU. Thank you. <laughs> and I studied there for many years, but focused on cancer research. So prostate cancer, why? Because it impacts the black community. Our men are dying from it, and I need to reach them. I need to educate them. And I study BRCA1 gene and breast cancer. So for me, it was really important to focus about illnesses and ailments that impacted my community. Once I graduated um, from Howard University, I was recruited by one of the biggest companies that I knew of at the time, which was Colgate Palmolive Company. And they were located in New Jersey. And I relocated and I helped launch $2 billion brands, got about 10 world pa patents and three, yes, three US patents. Now, I've had many, many um, scientific journals, but all this research I was doing was bringing me back to this one point, which is marijuana or cannabis is medicine. And I was like, there's something fundamentally wrong with this, you know, this conversation we're having. And so once I finished my MBA, um, because um, Colgate Palmolive Company wanted to fast track me up into their headquarters, we said, do I go into big pharma or do I continue this path in corporate America or do I create my own path? And that was a serious question for me. Do I go into this unknown world because there was something that was whispering behind me saying that you have the education to do this. You have some resources to do it and the only reason you're not because it's the fear the fear of being incarcerated, the fear of having my family impacted, the fear of what has happened to my community based upon the impact, the war on drugs have been horrible. So I said to my husband, let me have this opportunity and if it doesn't happen, it's okay. And he said, all right, let's do it. And that's my ride or die, y'all. <laughs> Shout out to Michael Bobo. <laughs> and so it took me about um, three months to write my first application, 421 pages. Um, I had been writing grants, though, for Howard University for years. I, when I went back to Washington, D.C., I was actually the director of STEM education at Howard University, and I created a pipeline of over 2,500 minority students to help them through STEM education to become part of this diverse workforce. And with that, I used that same skill set to write a medical marijuana um, application. So three months, 16 hour days, 
it was completely insane, crying, happy, you know, the highs, the lows, I can do this, I'm not going to get locked up, I'm going to get locked up, who's going to watch my kids, you know, so I'm a woman, I have to embrace what that feels like for me, and um, we went ahead, submitted it day one, and then literally what happened to me was that we didn't hear anything for two years. So we were like, this is never going to happen. But the problem was is that, as we'll go into a little bit more detail later, is that you have to have the application. You have to pay the application fee, but you have to have real estate. And so in order for me to have real estate, I had to have a lease and I had to pay monthly rent. So again, humble backgrounds. I'm a mother of four with a working class husband. And he said, I believe in you. And I said, baby, we can't afford this rent, though. You know, we have to pay for our mortgage. And he was like, but I believe in you. And we lost our home. But we won our medical marijuana dispenser. <laughs> we won it. Let me tell you. This industry is not for the weak at heart. I'm telling you, people will turn against you. They think that this is about money. If you don't have the passion in your heart about the patient, don't do it. Because after I sacrificed our livelihood to get there, we had the license. And my landlord said, I didn't think you were going to win. And I'm pulling your lease. What was I to do? You can't move because of the regulations. See, they play this game with you to keep you out. They write things intentionally to keep you out. And they have done it because at the time, I was the second woman of color to have a license. How could that happen in the nation? So I went back to work. Literally, I wrote another grant for Howard University and did research, took medical students, PhD students, and advanced undergraduates to Ethiopia, and I trained, trained them on biomedical research. I did what I've been doing because that's what I do. And I sucked up my loss, and I was in Ethiopia training them in malaria research, and I get a call from the Department of Health, and the Department of Health says to me, you have 30 days to do something with this license or you will lose it. And in one last effort, I went back to the landlord and I said, please, just give me one chance. You can have all the conditions, the contingencies, just give me this one chance. And he changed his mind. Let me tell you, someone was stressed. I was so because now I got what I wanted, but I only had 30 days to take four walls and make it into a medical marijuana dispensary. And I was like, okay, I can do this. I got this far. I can continue to do this. And so literally, I called everyone up. We were in the, <laughs> the building, and we were making it in. We had people bringing their couches over for the reception area. We had people's TV. I'm telling you, we made it work, and I passed in my inspection. <laughs> you know, you were calling in favors like, hey, cuz, can you get that security over here? <laughs> So I thought that was going to be the end of my challenge, right? I was like, yeah, we did it. And then they were like, okay, you got to buy inventory. And so I started, you know, talking to the different cultivators that were already in the market. And I said, you know, I don't have any patience, but I'm going to get there. Can you just give me some strains to get started? And then I hit my next challenge, which was no one would sell to me. I'm telling you, I cannot make this up. This has been documented. It's been so insane. No one would sell to me. And there was one black grower in Washington, D.C. 
that said, you know, this is how they regulate the market. They don't want to see you grow. And he's like, I have my one operation here, and I'm doing what I can to keep my head above water. But I'll give you one ounce of Buffalo Soldier and one ounce of Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I was able through my educational platform to grow my patient base to over 250 patients at that time. So again, I didn't have the selection of the strains, but if you came in and you told me about your ailment and condition, I could actually help you. I could show you how to dose, I could start explaining how the medicine worked, and my patients trusted me. From there, I had another grower come in and said, all right, I'll give you 10 strains, but you have to buy all 10 of them, and then once you buy all 10 of them, I know the going market rate for a pound is $4,000 for a pound. We're in the East Coast, guys. Let's just keep it real, right? <laughs> so <laughs> he charged me $6,500 a pound. Now, I can't say, you know, there's nothing that says there's, oh, that's racism. That's, you know, sexism. That's this and that. What I can tell you, he didn't do that to anyone else. So again, I had no choice. I reached out to a couple of people that I asked for investments. And they're like, oh, you're not gonna see it there. I'm not gonna invest in you. And I said, you know, well, I have the license and everyone thinks you have the license and we have all this money come in. And again, it doesn't work like that. So literally I'm like, mom, <laughs> I need help. I will pay you back because I need help, please let me just get these strains and let me get past this next hurdle. Well, I did it. I'm over 10,000 patients today, what are they gonna say? <laughs> I mean, these are the realities. And then when I got to that place where I felt secure, one of my growers came to me and said, how did you get here? I said, what do you mean? He's like, how did you do it? And I said, oh, because I look like this, I don't have a right to be here? Like, I didn't ask you how you got here. You're equal to me. So what makes you feel like you have the authority to question my place in this industry when I never question yours? So again, I want you to know that you're gonna face these same obstacles. They haven't went away. So when you talk about what's my passion, my passion is supporting my community, regardless. So when Jacoby said he needs me up on his stage, guess where I am? When I see minorities are treated a certain way in this industry, I have to have my voice with the Minority Cannabis Business Association. I have to make that impact. And when I've seen women, I mean talented women that are less than 26% represented in this industry, I have to reach out. But if I think about any type of woman, any person of color, you're discriminated just before you start. I was in New York literally three months ago, room full of 30 white men, and I was the only black woman in the room and person of color. And the man came up to me and said, can you get me a glass of water? <laughs> this is New York. This is New York. And I said, well, I don't know where it is, but I'm thirsty, so you get me a glass when you find out. <laughs> So my word is that I know we have some wonderful other speakers today. I'm going to tell you the realities of licensing. I'm going to tell you the realities that you have to know in order to enter into this market now. The market has changed so much. And that's where I have to say this is what is entry level, but there's other ways to enter. 
And I want you to know what your options truly are because I'm really here to help. God bless you and thank you. Thank you.